Okay. Hi, everyone in YouTube land. Anthony Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. Hope you're doing well. And we are here for an exclusive interview with Mr. Robin Pecknold, singer-songwriter, frontman of the Fleet Foxes. I, I don't know why I said the there. I, I think it's kind of the boomer energy that the chat was giving me. Yeah, the, the boomer energy the chat was giving me earlier, I think, is why I threw the the in there. But uh, yes, new record, sure, out right now, uh, from Fleet Foxes and Anti, I believe. So yeah. if you want that record, it's out there. Review my review, many other reviews, uh, many other positive reviews too out there right now if you want to take in those as well. Uh, we're going to be talking about the new record and the lead up to that and anything else that comes up in this conversation, starting with Robin, how are you doing? I'm, uh, all things considered, I'm great. Yeah, okay. it's, I've had this great distraction the last few months finishing this album and getting it out super quick and anytime I... I'm not distracted by that. I'm pretty uh, distraught and anxious about everything that's going on. And that debate last night was a nightmare, but I'm doing well. Yeah, all things considered, it is it has, has more meaning than I think it's uh, ever had in our lifetimes. Totally. <laughs> yeah. So okay, so let's let's distract from that a little bit because I don't think anyone in the chat needs a need, needs a, a reminder and have their PSD from last night come back um, yeah. from that shit. But uh, uh, new record, sure, uh, it's out now. Loving so many tracks off of it, and and a lot of the narratives coming through on these tracks. First of which I want to talk to you about is a uh, is Sunblind, which I think I was drawn to because. In, in a way, I mean, obviously that track is very personal to you, but it's it all, also a, a very music nerdy type of moment. We're getting some inspirations. We're getting that listed off. We're getting references. We're getting mentions. We're getting footnotes in a way. Um, and, and talking about kind of coronating their memories or kind of your appreciation for the work that they did or the impact that it had on you. Like, is, is this track and this album kind of marking a pilgrimage for you in a way, um, almost like a, a musical Mecca. I'm going to be turning to the East and, you know, worshiping and, you know, almost like a, a religious experience, but, uh, I'm kind of just, a just from, from the spirit of music in a way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think like, yeah, I guess we're, you know, we're, we're the same age and I was thinking about that, you know, thinking about talking to you and, and, you know, everything you do and you, you being, such a big music fan and me feeling like I'm primarily a music fan before I'm a musician a little bit, you know? And I think like, you know, you, you, you found your path in being in love with music and I kind of found mine and, you know, but there's, there's ways in which they're not that different. Mm -hmm. And I think like, um, you know, I wanted this record to be a little less personal than, than crack up and then helplessness blues. You know, I felt like a lot of, I didn't want to kind of, do a, a big soul searching kind of, um, you know, solipsistic thing as, you know, as cool as that can be. And as to how, how, you know, that can actually, I found out that that can actually mean a lot to people, you know, finding music like that, that resonates w with some interior state. I wanted it to be much more, having done that kind of twice, I wanted this to be much more outward looking and, and kind of like, um, more for other people and about other people. And, and, um, I think, you know, like having the having the record open with a with a female singer, you know, mm -hmm. that that kind of signaled that that would be, you know, the, the more of the approach, this would be less about me as the songwriter and more about other people lyrically and then other contributors musically. And then I, for, you know, for the last year and a half, I knew that I wanted the first line of the song to be of the that I sang to be for Richard Swift, you know, because mm -hmm. he meant so much to, to my community. And, you know, I knew him pretty well, but many people I know knew him much better than I do. Um, and, and, you know, I've been just being in this, you know, obviously now we're in this period where there's, you know, plague and death surrounding us and more heroes of ours have died. And, you know, I was really reflecting on that and just, you know, thinking about music as this kind of, you know, cause when you're influenced by a set of people and, and you're, you're, you know, taking ideas from them musically and trying to do something with them, you're carrying their memory forward, even if you're not kind of saying their name out loud. But I guess on this song, I just wanted to say that, say those names out loud and kind of set it up and, and, and find a way to kind of, um, you know, get to have the song end up some, the, the magic trick to me seems like having the song end up somewhere joyous that didn't feel corny or that felt like it got there um, in a way that 
was you know still respectful of, of how it how those name how it gets set up you know hmm. so and it was actually like the last sunblind was the last song that came together for the album and only kind of really came together like four or five weeks ago hmm. and once it was there i was like it was like finally the missing piece of the whole thing finally finally fell into place you know um yeah i mean it does that does feel that that's kind of interesting. I, I don't want to, there's so many things that I could go off of from what you just said, and I don't want to lose track of any of them, but, but uh, you're telling me the closer was done before Sunblind because the closer almost seems like a direct response to Sunblind. It seems like the answer to the question or just kind of like, you know, an, an epilogue in a way almost. Yeah. I mean, the, the closer was, well, let's see, the closer was done lyrically and then Sunblind, it was like a, you know, mystery novel. You write the ending first and work your way backwards. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> the Simpsons. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh but sunblind i only had those names and then i didn't have the chorus until like a month ago mm. and i just one morning on this guitar i borrowed from this guy um i just wrote that chorus and then it all made sense and recorded the roughs that day and then you know another thing i wanted on this record was, was for there to be kind of um musical you know musical elements that were had a resonance with the lyrics but that it wasn't you wouldn't know unless you were told like Homer Steinweiss, who plays drums on that song, hmm. um, played with Richard Swift in the Arcs, hmm. and they did a double, double drum thing in that band for you know for that tour. And um, Joshua Yeager also plays drums on that song, and he's a big Homer is a big hero of Joshua's, and so to have them do a double drum thing, kind of in honor of Richard, but then Joshua was supposed to be on the on David Berman's final tour that was supposed to happen a, a year a year or so ago, hmm. um, you know. So so getting those guys on the song, kind of like you know, having that resonance with the lyric and, and, you know, um, I don't know, that all happened just in a, you know, a, a, a few days, like a month ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, b before we go into another question, can we dial it back onto the opener really quickly? Because it's not something I talked about at length in the review. I mean, I like the opener. I think it's a pretty moment yeah. on the record, but your decision to have a guest singer sort of start the record was something that, Though there are a lot of interesting and profound things said on the album, it's not something I quite was able to make sense of, which is why I didn't go deep into it myself yeah. or try to, you know, make a supposition about what your decision making was going into that. Um, you know, I've read, obviously, that you appreciate her abilities as as a singer, but go a little bit more into this idea of this album being less about you and more about other people or other things mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, the, the uh, meaning behind sort of having a guest in that moment. Yeah. I mean, I had that piece of music and I, I tried to sing it, but it just didn't feel like me, you know? And then, a, a, you know, maybe a couple of weeks after that, someone sent me that cl a clip of her singing a Fleet Fox's song called Mykonos. And I was like, there, there's the voice, you know, like that's, that's oh. got, it's got to be her. And, um, you was know, it, was this like a fan recording or like on YouTube or something or yeah, just her Instagram account where she, she covers people's songs. And, and wait, wait, let, let's, let's point people to that. What, what Instagram account is that? It's uade.music, okay. U-W-A-D-E dot music. Okay. And so if you scroll back a year or so, there's a clip of her doing Mykonos, and that's why she's on the record. Got it. Um, yeah. And then, you know, lyrically on that one, it is more impression. I, I wanted it to be like a more impressionistic short song. That was another thing that, you know, with, with Crack Up, there was very long songs, and, and this was more like finding fun ways to make short songs um, that felt like, you know, uh, they they worked as individual songs, but they also connected to to other individual songs in ways that felt as cohesive as a six to eight minute song would on on a previous record. You know? mm. So it was the the first song was more of an impressionistic thing lyrically, but you know the the lyrics about like and we're finally aligning. You know, I was thinking about that in terms of like, you know, just kind of feeling. It was really just because last this past july and august the experience of working on the, the music was so um kind of electric and and charmed feeling that it was like almost those lyrics were you know the singers speaking to music like music is is finally like um back in her good graces or something hmm. yeah but it's, it's it's meant to be kind of a you know a, a somewhat mysterious intro and then sunblind with for richard swift that's like when the record kicks off. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I think it's an interesting choice, especially given like the vocal approach that you take on a Fleet Foxes record is so distinct. You know, it's, yeah. it's really just uh, almost like an interestingly jarring uh, change yeah. of pace. Um, well, I, I want to ask you a little bit more about what I see as almost like the spirituality of the record. 
Um, le- <laughs> leading up to the review, if I like an album, sometimes I will purposefully look up like maybe negative criticisms of that record or just sort of like, you know, derisive criticisms of a record just to sort of see maybe what other people are thinking once I've kind of decided how I feel because maybe there'll be a blind spot or maybe there'll be something that's worth almost like responding to in a general way. And, you know, there, there were some people sort of bringing up this idea that like, oh, it sounds like music from Christian camp or something, which I mean, <laughs> I... I don't entirely, I, I, don't, I don't entirely agree with, or I guess even partially agree with, but the, the part of it where I think maybe there is something to that is there is a spirituality to the album. You know what I yeah. mean? The way that you're kind of displaying these musical figures, the way that um, almost in a biblical way, you know, not, uh-huh. not obviously that in, in a way that feels like it's linked to any kind of direct organized religion, but there, there are like morals to a lot of what you're trying to say in many of these compartmentalized mm-hmm. songs. Um, mm-hmm. You know, almost like a verse or, you know, a, a famous tale from a religious text or something. Um, mm-hmm. You know, is, is, is that intentional at all? Is there kind of an otherworldliness in your mind to a lot of what you're writing? And, and a lot of what's inspiring this record? Well, I mean, you know, I have to separate the lyrics and the music because, you know, the music is was took a year and a half to make. Hmm. And and it was, um, you know, it, it, if you muted the vocals that, you know, that's that was pretty much what it was going to be back in February before lockdown. But then there was this like three month lockdown where nothing happened hmm. and I hadn't written any lyrics for the record because I just didn't know how to write what I was going to write about or like how to connect what I wanted the music to sound like with because there you know there there was a there was a lane in which some of these songs could have ended up with lyrics that were just like and we're having a good time you know and I can't do that I just don't know how to do that like with any kind of I just couldn't release that with a straight face but some but I just wasn't finding other ideas for some of these songs Hmm. Um, and then you know I guess lockdown you know triggered all these kind of so the, the lyrics were written really just in June, like all in June all, for all 15 songs. I just ended up writing all the lyrics and, and um, there was something about that experience, I guess, like, you know, the experience over the summer that I had in June, July, August, finishing this album, which was like working every single day, really trying to get the record done, working 12 to 14 hours a day, every day, trying to get the record done by September 8th so that it could come out on September 22nd, hmm. um, you know, was just like, There were just so many, it was just like such a blessing to be working on music again and such a blessing to be like um, doing it in this way that felt kind of like gracious because it wasn't going to be attached to a big tour or something. And I knew that if we just put it out right away, it wasn't going to be part of this huge ad campaign. So there's something about like, um, and there were all these crazy coincidences that would have happened as far as like people who would come through the studio or, you know, who, who would, um, you know, I'd, I'd walk in one day and Beatrice would be counting to test the tape machine. She'd be counting one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three into the tape machine right after I'd listened to Brian Wilson sample where he's counting in four. Hmm. You know, I'd been listening to that 20 minutes before and the song we were supposed to work on was a polyrhythm of three over four. I sound crazy. But anyway, so it was, it, this is, a, I am trying to get to the spirituality thing because there was something about- I, I, feel, I, feel, I feel it coming. Okay. <laughs> Like it was a very charmed 90 days of working on it in June, July, August. And so I think that I really fell back in love with music in a really serious way um, over the end of the recording process to, you know, to the point that I had access to that kind of spiritual feeling that music can, can give you that I've had from music, maybe mostly when I was younger. Um, and definitely in certain times working on songs or, you know, having a really amazing show or having an idea come to you out of nowhere, you know, just the kind of like, you know, I was feeling spiritual, but it was, it's, and whenever I felt spiritual in my life, it's always been via, via music, either working on music or being moved by music or like being at a show that feels like mass or, you know, it is, it is religious to me in some way and that it's mysterious, but it requires, I'm not religious uh, in any way, but like uh, organized because I get whatever I need. I've always gotten what I, that kind of, you know, fulfillment from music. Um, and then just the last three months was just like the most intense version of that that I've ever felt. 
Yeah, I mean, it, a weird comparison in my own mind as I was listening to portions of it and reflecting on a lot of what you were saying and the meaning in it um, was that track or two where Killer Mike is pretty much saying the same thing about music being a religious experience for him off of his rap music record, which mm -hmm. I know is a weird comparison to maybe make no, to the Fleet Foxes LP. But, you know, again, it's kind of a similar message. Not um, at all. It's the same thing. It's like, yeah, yeah it's community binder and, and like, there's this mass catharsis and mass bonding and, you know, it's the same. Which, um, you know, on a detour before I go into the next thing I wanted to say is, is kind of a difficult thing, I think, to fully create a link to because that almost like a piece of the puzzle, the live puzzle is like missing right now. Oh, I know. You know it's, you totally. Can, you yeah, can't I'm create excited. that in-person sensation in a way with it. For sure. For sure. Um, you know, so so that's really interesting that the lyrics and the music sort of underwent this totally separate process in a way, um, you know, cutting out a lot of the themes and narratives uh, and inspirations that went into into your writing um, on the lyrical side. What was driving things on the musical side? Because, I mean, as, as I kind of pointed out in in the review, because I talked, you know, pretty extensively about the lyrics and then the instrumentals, because they do have to two totally different characters in mm -hmm. a way. Like, you know, yeah. there's a lot of drums and bass on this record. You know, you guys were yeah. kind of rocking it on this one. Like, was that yeah. just something you've been wanting to do? Was that something that you felt like was missing or would bring something refreshing? Have you just been into more rhythmic stuff? I mean, I guess, uh, uh, you know, you do mention Arthur Russell on the record in a way. Is, mm -hmm. is that connected at all? Though I know there are other aspects of his music that obviously influence what you do. I think there are some vocal similarities there, and he's no stranger to yeah. doing singer-songwriter type stuff. But obviously yeah. the art pop stuff and the more rhythmic stuff, um, you know, l l let me let me know or let us know, like, what's fueling that or what fueled that in a way? Yeah. Well, I just got really into Hoobastank, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just kind of felt I kind of fell back in love with 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 the stank. Under underrated <laughs> under underrated singles though. Underrated. Actually, okay. Actually, it actually is one of my karaoke songs. The reason. <laughs> oh my god! So I so I so I so I so so, 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 so what you're telling me is I called it. What you're telling me. What you're telling me is I fucking called that shit. I was like, he found me out. I'm trying to talk about Arthur Russell. But but, but, really but you know what that is? You know what that is also? It's us being the same age and that song coming at a certain time. That song has a weird, it, it, it does occupy a strange, um, yeah, it has its own, it's on its own tier. I, I, and I don't even recall really enjoying it that much at the time. But for whatever reason, into my 30s, when, you know, the song doesn't play on the radio anymore, it's still in there. It's there. still stuck in my sight. Na, 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 na. Oh. <laughs> Great song. So I got, I would just listen to that. No, no, no. Um, I mean, I was, <laughs> it was tough. Cause I mean, you know, it's like, I feel like a lot of the stuff that I was, I made big playlists and like stuff I was inspired by, you know, like I get inspired by, do you know that song, uh, uh, Call on My Friend by Aminaz, mm. that African band? No, go ahead. I would get into these kind of like, you know, kind of, poorly recorded like bedroom soul songs you mm. know and then just get really into like the charm of those recordings and like try and 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 the simplicity of certain um certain arrangements or certain melodies i think and 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 wanting to have some of that feel like just kind of a little bit jank and a little bit kind of um casual and then i think you know a lot of the like emphasis on drums and stuff that was all coming mostly from just thinking about ways this could be different from different from and complementary to crack up because I really like that record I'm really proud of that one hmm. um, but I didn't want to it felt kind of like mission accomplished in terms of that you know it's a little bit like um I was thinking about this as more like the like the dam I guess Did, have you heard that album no no dam like what from what from Kendrick Lamar? <laughs> like Kendrick which day? Lamar. Are you yeah, yeah. That <laughs> yeah, I'm familiar with it. Have you heard of my YouTube channel? Where we, I, th I think we have, I think we have a review on it. Uh, that's my that's my personal favorite. No. Got it. <laughs> so this was, I, it was a little bit like that, where like I felt like Crack Up was, you know, trying to make this big big thing, big statement, and then this would I wanted to complement that, but a different approach, like more rhythm. Um, like brighter songs hmm. and just less more of an outward focus and less of a kind of like interior thing hmm. um, so you know I feel like 
a lot of the inspiration behind what the record would be came from thinking about, yeah, like I said, ways it would be different, ways to make something that would be kind of the opposite of crack up, but not be bad, you know, because it, it, and it felt like risky to be like, um, after two kind of more, like not morbid, but two kind of like, you know, dour records to be like taking the risk of trying to make something that had some optimism in it and finding a way to do that in a way that felt true to, to, to me. And that felt like, and that also was helping me because I wasn't, you know, there were moments of making this where I was just as kind of exhausted or melancholy as ever, you know, but, but the music was kind of like always fun to, to, to work on and always kind of brought a charge to the day and brought some energy to the day. Um, you know, that's, that's interesting that, that you say that because one thing that I've known about you since I've started following you on social media, not just listening to your music, but following you on social media is that you've, you've in a way almost been long, been a long time defender of positive music, of uplifting music, of, of feel good music. And, and you've been sort of a, a detractor from the notion that, what is it? You get more gas, you get more fuel out of depressing stuff or depressing music is superior and, and that sort of thing. Like what, what did it feel like to personally have to put yourself in that position where now I have to write the up uplifting song and not sound corny doing it? Because that's often, yeah. the, you know, if, if you write anything that's in a good mood, that's that's always the criticism that comes first. It's corny. Oh, totally. It's such a it's a complete minefield. Yeah. And there was like um, it's, you know, it felt there was, I think Crack Up, it took kind of, it took balls, I guess, to commit to that as like, here's the, com like the album after six years, this is the album. And it's like this super dense, you know, kind of task. And it, I, I love that album. I'm so proud of it. But like, you know, it, it that there's also with that, there's kind of a, um, you know, there's not a lot of danger in, in being indirect or being kind of hard to decode. You know, because you can just explain it away as being oblique, you know, and so just trying, you know, trying to find the way to, um, to, to, yeah, just do, do music like this, you know, in a way that felt true to me and that didn't feel corny, um, was, was felt like the, the challenge worth undertaking. Um, and because, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's rare. And I think finding stuff like that, like Arthur Russell, you know, there's just, it's just disarming or like John Prine, you know, that's like, meaningful in this way that and it, you know he has this wry kind of wonderful sense of humor but it's not like corny and it's not i think i was just trying to find that stuff that or like the happy nina simone songs like in the morning or you know uh, her 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 covers that have have all this joy and, and you know j j that are just as good to me as as her you know very passionate songs that are so powerful you know but just they're like healing in a different way you know mm. but um but, but I mean, my favorite record is still, you know, like Sybil Byer, that really m m like color green, really um, moody that, I mean, I listened to that on tour, like exclusively. And it's like, I understand how connecting with something like that. I understand how powerful, how powerful that is. Cause it's just like, if something is matching your mood in the right way, it's just like, you know, it's, it's wonderfully soothing, you know? Yeah, I mean, generally, I mean, I, I have my own theories about it, but, you know, why do you personally feel like there is kind of that general sense, though, inside and outside of critical circles and inside and outside artist circles, too, where uh, it's it's almost just like sadder music has more weight, more importance, more significance, more impact. I mean, again, I could I could throw my opinions out there, but I mean, what what are yours? Because, I mean, that that sentiment does exist. Absolutely. Um, I'm really curious your theory. What's you, can, my, okay? My, my uh, I per, personally and systematically and societally, I think yeah. a lot of it connects to just having a lack of outlets to express those feelings or relate yeah. to those feelings or um, you know explore them in a safe way, just in our average everyday lives. You know, That's on great. on a on a music album whether you're creating one or listening to one seems like one of the only society, societally acceptable ways to explore something like depression or suicidality yeah. or yeah. whatever, you know, sort of like deciding to up and have a conversation with it about, 
um, or have a conversation about it with your best friend or your mom or your dad or your teacher or this or whatever, you know, obviously puts it puts a damper on things. You know what I mean? Um, it's not commonly, you know, societally accepted to go and have that conversation that way. So I think when somebody does get hit with a record like that, um, yeah, sure. You know, it might be a good piece of music that explores uh, that particular thing in a really significant way. Um, but uh, but I'm sure the impact of that could be even heavier because then it's like, oh, you know, no one's ever told me about this or I've never had the ability to, you know, nobody's quite put it this way, or I've never had the opportunity to have this discussion with anybody. And and maybe that's not dawning at the person at the, on the person at the time listening to it, but um, still it doesn't make the impact any less great that in, at least in that small intimate way where you're listening or kind of consuming a piece of art, you're able to at least have somewhat of a better understanding by being able to relate to somebody else, you know, yeah, through it, through sure. a piece of art or something. I, I think it has a lot to do with that. Yeah, I think that's that's true. You think that that's, but um, that extends to critical reception as well. Yeah, because crit- critics are hurting too. It's it's just with everybody because it's yeah. it, you know it's no easier for someone who's a critic versus someone who's a fit because because we're all suffering as a result of these you know societal limitations or sort of what what is and what's not socially acceptable at the end of the day. You know, yeah. it's like there, there's there's not a subsection of American culture demographically or generationally. I mean, it's getting a little better now with sort of general conversations about mental health. But, um, you know, there's not a subset of American culture or society where it's just okay to discuss that stuff, you know, in a really open and honest and I'm just going to drop it all on you kind of way, you know? And Um, yeah, music is, is, I mean, every art form obviously can express every range of emotion, but I think people, music's the most direct one in terms of how, how emotionally attached people can get to it and how private that experience of listening to it can be sure. and how, and how it's just sound and, and, you know, they're, they're filling in all these blanks and, you know, I mean, Elliot, you know, getting obsessed with Elliot Smith when I was a teenager, that was what, you know, changed that changed my life more than anything. Hmm. And, you know, when he died, I printed out like 300 pictures of him and posted them all around school with like RIP written on them. And like, it was the super, you know, super intense, you know, I, I completely understand that. And, and, you know, that's how I attach to music too. I think like with this album, it was like, since all it was right, I was writing all the lyrics in lockdown or after three months of lockdown and just feeling like so grateful to have, you know, a, a, an apartment and to um, have this, my job be making music and just being so kind of like um, grateful also that there was this huge, you know, f- finally this groundswell of attention on class class injustice and racial injustice and systemic injustice. I think that, that all of that stuff, you know, it was just kind of like when it came time to write the lyrics, it just ended up, it wasn't going to be like, and now here are my sadnesses as this white male, straight white male, here are my sadnesses world. These are what we need to focus on right now. It just wasn't really going to end up that way, I think, just based on just the way, um, you know, just the kind of perspective I was in or the perspective I was feeling in June writing the lyrics, you know. So, yeah. All right. Um, Another thing that I wanted to to address that we talked about earlier, you know, just at the very start of the interview were some of the themes of youth that go into the record and and also Mm -hmm. just kind of the trajectory of your career at this point. I mean, you know, you came up during this uh, very critically acclaimed wave at the time of indie folk. Yeah. And a lot of the biggest artists that also rose up in that same wave are in incredibly different places right now. I mean, you know, not that he hasn't always been adventurous, but Sufjan Stevens is he's bleeping and blooping. Uh, Mm -hmm. Bon Iver is doing his own separate experimental thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, where, where's Grizzly Bear? Where, where are you, Ed? I know he's on Instagram. You know, he's, mm-hmm. he's doing fine. Phil Elvram is is very much in like a retrospective yeah. mood right now. Yeah. You know, um, but, you know, you, you with Fleet Fox, it seems like you're really just holding true to now. And for the most part, like sticking with what kind of got you to this point in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, but but obviously evolving it, you know, mm-hmm. Um at at this point, do you have any feelings on that wave kind of washing in and out? And do you almost feel like a veteran of, of that era at, at this point? 
Um, I mean, I think I've only started to think about that in the last couple of weeks since finishing the album, you know, because before that I was in album mode and I was kind of like, you know, you're we're not re really, the, I wasn't feeling that reflective, you know, and I think even um, I, some of that stuff I kind of blocked out of my memory just as kind of because it was so crazy. You know, I was like 22 years old and, and it was just a wild ride. And it was just, um, you know, it informed all of my decisions afterwards, you know, so it was kind of, I had to reckon with that a little bit. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, I think I feel like, like the thing that I, you know, just seeing that everything with the Fleet Fox name got a, Pitchfork Best New Music, I guess like seeing that in one picture that they posted was like a crazy moment of like, oh my God, like I've been, you know, yeah, this has been a while and it's been going on for a while. I, and it's not, I'm not just a, in a, a beginner, like I've been telling myself I am while working on this album, you know? Um, and I'm just uh, still reflecting on that stuff and still processing it, you know? And it's just been this kind of, always just this dance of trying to find the way to move forward that feels like creatively valuable and also you know is um you know yeah just creatively valuable and 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 um you know not not um you know i think like some of the signifiers that you could like attach to the first fleet foxes record maybe they'd be harder to attach to this one they wouldn't stick as well to this one in terms of like maybe like barefoot barn stomping folk music you know or something yeah um and so i think it took a while to kind of find a way out of that you know that that brand maybe that um that because that never was never something that i felt super comfortable with like in terms of the, the i mean the stuff you mentioned as i, I you know, all the stuff you just mentioned i love you know but there was also like another more popular way of the stuff that i felt a little less comfortable sure. attaching to um so it's just been you know just trying to find the way forward that 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 feels you know, um, creatively su sustaining and, and like, you know, and, you know, which pro finding projects or songs or, you know, points of view that feel like, yeah, that I can devote a year and a half to this. And I think that end product will be valuable to people. You know? And, and with the album finally being out and with the current COVID conditions, kind of putting things in a situation where you really have nothing else to do other than reflect on it in a way. Yeah. Um, you know, how are you feeling right now about just your creative prospects? You know, I mean, are you excited about the future of kind of evolving Fleet Fox's sound even further, taking more risks, doing different things? Like, you know, I, I know obviously you're not at a point where you're just getting started, but, um, you know, at this point, does the idea of recording a new record and getting that out a few years from now excite you still? Um, absolutely. Uh, maybe more than ever, because I feel like, you know, like the last song in this album, it ends in a very ex experimental way. Hmm. Um, and yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of layers to it. Yeah. The, the ending of Shore is like a pretty wild, you know, pulling apart of everything that has happened on the record, like all these memories dissolving or something. And so I felt like that was kind of, you know, setting up a next album that that isn't playing by the same rules as this one does, you know, just in the same way that this one doesn't play by the same rules as, as Crack Up. Um, and so I'm still thinking about what that looks like, you know, for sure. And, you know, but, but having all this time to kind of, cause you know, one thing about, one thing about the way it's gone, you know, with these album cycles and stuff is like, if you put out an album and you spend two years touring it, you're two years, that's two years where you're just in the mindset of that record that maybe you're kind of already past, you know, but you're having to per perform it, excuse me, perform it every night. And so even though it's devastating to everyone that I know who was relying on, you know, touring for income and, and you know, um, creatively, I'm, I'm a little bit grateful to have this chance to kind of just immediately start thinking about new stuff without kind of having lived in this shore music for two years of touring, you know. Um, so it's kind of like a creative opportunity that I've never had. And um, in that re for that reason, and everyone is set up for collaboration remotely or to, or in person, you know, like even beyond like Fleet Fox's members or, you know, if the other projects or co-running with other people, I have nothing but time for that kind of thing. Hmm. And you know, I feel like kind of like with Crack Up being a mission accomplished kind of vibe, I feel that way about this record too. Like, I don't know if I would want to go, you know, I would want the next thing to be its own world again. And so, 
you know, that's just going to be a really fun thing to, to explore over the next few months or next year. Okay. Um, just to let you guys know, we're going to be taking, uh, some viewer questions, uh, and, uh, throwing those Robin's way in a second. Um, before I do that, I have one more question I wanted to ask you. So yeah. Fleet Foxes, Helplessness Blues, <laughs> yeah. uh, record got album of the year for me in 2010. Um, Father Thank John, you. Father John Misty, Pure Comedy happened as well, but years later though. And you uh -huh. also coming onto my Twitch page before Josh Tillman as well. Is there anything else you're going to beat him to the punch next? Are you planning your next move on <laughs> what you're going to do before him? Yeah, because oh, you, you, you got you got album of the year for me before him. You got on my Twitch page yeah. before him. So I mean way. you're you're here, where is he? So I mean, yeah, you know, obviously you're exactly. looking at what that guy's doing, you're like, I gotta get that shit before I think bef I mean before before. Where, where, yeah, I mean like you need to like I'm I'm here for you, Anthony. Like yeah. I'm here. <laughs> I'm in the Twitch, dude. <laughs> me in the Twitch, dude. I see I see that. I see that. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to beat him to. <laughs> <laughs> what just do you think just, about that. Just what ask him. Know? Just feeling it out. Just, just, just curious. Just, just I'll, curious. I'll circle back around to that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll have a, I'll have a good um, non-inflammatory answer to that by the end of the fan questions. Okay. Good. 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 Um, all right. So, so, uh, so, so let me throw you some of these. Uh, these nerdy ass fan questions at you. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Is, is, is this a little <clears throat> sample action that I was missing at the time? Someone named tipster one thirty five wants to know, is that a street fighter? Perfect on young man's game. No, that, that's a me. I don't know. Is a uh, Capcom going to say, yeah, that, yeah, that's, 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 that's like a studio thing. I'm I, sure. I said that. Perfect. Yeah. Per, like yeah. That, that was, that was, that was, what's you. the street fighter one? Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. It's, like, it's oh, totally perfect. different sound. They, they, totally. I, I guess, I guess they just want to know if you're a gamer. You know, it's different. It's totally different baseline. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Marzipan wants to know, is there really a difference in feeling between, okay. So is there a difference in feeling loved by the fans versus being loved by the critics? Do you sort of value one over the other? Do you get different sensations from either? Oh, that's an interesting question. Hmm. I mean, I think, I think, um, I think I used to really look and no offense. I used to oh, really of, look of, offend me. That's, that's literally why you're here. So okay. just, just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you you already called me out on the Hoobastank thing, so just just call me the fuck out again. That's that totally was... it's totally fair. <laughs> no, I think when I was younger, I was like so because I like I said, like I'm a music fan. Like I grew up reading criticism and being a music fan and like like absorbing all of this stuff. Like like you know, just that's just more that's more who I am than I'm a musician. I feel like, and so critics were just like I I. I I didn't, they weren't even, they were like, you know, your teachers at school where you saw them outside of school, it, it was like they're, they're superhuman or something. Hmm. And so I think early on, I thought more about the critical thing meant a lot more to me just because it was just this, I felt like it was this world of wizened old geniuses, you know, decreeing that these albums were good or bad. And, and I think like more and more now, I, I, as I kind of have a better handle on what, um, like, I feel like, I'm accomplishing what I set out to do more now, as far as like having a really clear idea for an album and making it happen and finding the songs that fit that idea and, you know, putting a lot of time and energy into it. Um, and so more and more, like, I think I have my own, you know, I don't, um, I mean, the Hoobastank thing was a left, that was a curveball. <laughs> that was not on my radar. So I can't say that I'm like, I know exactly what I'm doing. Cause clearly I, I mean, I missed the hoobs think the clear hoobs think uh, Achilles heel. <laughs> but, it's because it's because I know we're the same age. It's, it's buried in our psyche the same way. That's that's yeah. all I can say. But um, uh, I think the fan reaction means seeing it mean a lot to people, and people are already getting tattoos and like all this crazy, you know, covers, and that is like so meaningful to me in a kind of a that. You know, they're both meaningful, but that feels like a little bit more, I don't know, there's like a little more heart there or something. No offense. No, that's, there's, there's, you know, it's, it's a personal thing because obviously, you know, they're, they're doing what they're doing for personal reasons as opposed to, I mean, look, I wouldn't be re reviewing your music at all if Anti didn't send me that $100,000 check. 
you know exactly I mean? right yeah, like, yeah, totally would, would i even be reviewing the record if they hadn't set the check in the mail yeah no would, would, you, would you be no. here if they hadn't sent the extra 50 grand no of course not no, totally no. Totally. And me so. DMing you, Anthony, please review me at least a strong seven, at least, please. Yes, that and and that that in addition helps. You see, uh, Father John Missy, he doesn't do that. He yeah. doesn't do that. See, that's why he's not. That's why he's not on the Twitch page. So. Exactly. Yeah, just so you know, you see your strategy, your strategizing. Um, Green Giant Two Hundred One wants to know uh, what was the most valuable thing that you learned when you went back to school. Oh, uh, most valuable thing that when I went back to school. Yeah. Um, I guess like the location of the good coffee shop up there for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that was the most That's important all. thing. That's it. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> well, it was important to go back and, and finish that. So, it, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, what was your favorite order when going up there? I, I guess follow up. Oh, eight ounce Americano and a little like. They have these little peanut butter cookies. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Got it. Um, the, this this one person had an interesting question that I think is uh, is is based upon I I, th I think a bit of you know it, it, an assumption or a presumption about you and your music. I mean, obviously okay. there there is a story of pilgrimage to the album itself. So maybe there is, you know, some truth here, but this, this person wants to know, are there any particular camping trips that have inspired you? Tamas music. Now, I, I think it's a bit of a stereotype that, you know, you are between albums and then you're like, what am I going to do? I'm going to go out camping. And then it's just like you mm -hmm. camp for three months and you're like, oh, I have the album in my mind. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's, it, can, can you address this kind of like um, this, this presumption of kind of like a rustic connection to you know, mm -hmm. and every, you know, your sound and your style, you, does, does that extend to your personal life in a way, I guess? Um, well, I've had phases in my life um, where, so, I mean, the first thing to state about that is that, you know, um, there wasn't much time for any kind of rusticity between the release of the Fleet Foxes album and the end of the Helplessness Blues tour, because I was just, you're in a tin can, that was four years of tin can life. Hmm. Um, and you're either in a recording studio or you're in a, uh, a bus, you know, and then that was all this amazing, wonderful experience, but um, I didn't get to like flex my camping bona fides in those years. Hmm. But then in the years between Crack Up and Helplessness, I was very, like I spent a ton of time outdoors. Hmm. And the only stuff on this album that references the outdoors are actually kind of memories of those experiences. Hmm. And so, you know, there's a song called For a Week or Two that, you know, for me, I was kind of like in lockdown remembering this one trip I took where I, you know, uh, hiked this like 20 mile trail in Big Sur that started, you know, really high up in in in, in those mountains and then kind of ended up at, 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 at this beach and you're just kind of riding a ridge down the whole way. And um, I remember like being out there for a couple of days and, and, and uh, like just kind of sleeping on the ground and I didn't really bring any equipment. It was like, I just planned to do the whole hike kind of like pretty quick and just sleep one night and then just make it the next day. And so, it was, and I was just by myself. And then um, it was just kind of a, a, I was just having like fond memories of that trip. And then the lyrics came out of that. And then I, there was one moment on that trip where like, I didn't really know, knew who I was. I wasn't really eating. And then there was like a space shuttle that, that was being transported to like California or something that flew in front of my, um, like field of vision over the, over the water. And it was just like, I had no idea what was going on or what year it was, or, you know, it was just this weird kind of liminal few days. And then I, so that song, you know, is remembering that fondly kind of. And so, you know, I think if there, if there's, but I'm, you know, I'm gentle with those things now, I think, you know, more gentle than I used to be. Like those references that are there are all pretty directly from my life. And there, and there are plenty of songs on the album that don't touch any kind of like signifiers of rust, rustic, um, you know, that's not like something I'm still like really pushing as a, as a, as a gimmick or something. Yeah. Um, AK3331 <laughs> wants to know, uh, what inspires some of the more improvisational moments on your songs? Uh, they reference um, the Shrine and Argument as an example. Uh, you know, do you do multiple takes in the studio and just kind of like go back and see what works and what doesn't and that sort of thing? Is that how you kind of file through that? Is there something else going on? Um, I love I love having improvisational stuff. Like that thing recording with Morgan, the ending of the Shrine, you know, he just, 
we set up the stereo microphone and then he just kind of made two rounds walking around the stereo microphone so that you know the image of the of the the two um the two competing lines that he was playing were kind of panning around each other but it was just him walking around the studio hmm. and um i think on crack up and on on this album um I tried to make a lot of room for for you know just just laying down a part once like all this all the piano stuff on the song featherweight you know that was rounds of improvisations and i wasn't writing that part and then it was just kind of like picking out the best improvisation and then and then you know putting it in the, in that spot hmm. um there was plenty of stuff like you know the, there's a lot of horn improvisation on the record like um you know that was a cool place to kind of let people you know, Chris, Chris Bear drumming, you know, he, he was doing improv a lot. That's, a, you know, I like bringing people in who, who have a kind of framework of, of what the part needs to be, but then have leeway within that to, to be free and to end to record, um, you know, because there's so much cool stuff that comes out of, comes out by accident or comes out by chance, you know, but it's kind of like it, for me, it's always as a kind of embellishment or, you know, once there's a sturdy song beneath it, then you can, you have the leeway to fill it in with these kind of um, improv details, you know. Hmm. Um, the, this individual, Tamine, wants to know, we get this question often, uh, some people are just uh, interested to know what are some of your more favorites in terms of more contemporary artists, you know, newer bands, newer singers, newer songwriters whose work may also be impressing you or inspiring you. Mm -hmm. um, I love Jessica Pratt. I think, you know, I, I listen to her music like very often. Yeah, she's got um, a unique voice, a unique uh, yeah, great, timbre. Great voice and just really finding that right lane in terms of like, you know, wistful psychedelic folk that's not, you know, too, that's not super archaic feeling, but mm. it still has all those warm qualities and those kind of mysterious qualities that that old recordings have, but doesn't feel like throwbacky, you know, because of the, how she's singing or what, I don't know, just the way it's put together. Or, I listen to that stuff a lot. I got really into Chris Cohen. Um, I think he has a really wonderful way of constructing songs. You know, I think like people sometimes don't pay enough attention to that. Um, I got pretty into the Wise Blood album on this drive I was taking. I would listen to that. I didn't really listen to it like when it came out, but then I was listening to it on this drive and I was impressed by it. The songwriting and um as far as like but this year's been tough because i haven't really been i mean obviously like um you know kevin morby and waxahachie i'm a huge fan of theirs and mm -hmm. um but i haven't been as i like the phoebe bridgers record a lot but i haven't been that i haven't i've been less curious the last year or so with new music just because i've been working on this album and yeah. so I think when it's, now this is done, I feel like, you know, that's when you kind of open your ears back up and kind of start digging into more new stuff. Uh, you know, just just personal question for me. Do you feel like your music taste at all over the years, you know, since Fleet Foxes broke onto the scene has kind of changed with the massive paradigm shift that, you know, we've seen in terms of like uh, the hierarchy of what <laughs> genres are popular and streaming and so on and so forth. I, I guess really what I'm getting at here is, is, uh, in in this hiatus, are you going to listen to 100 Gex? Because right now, I like them. I, yeah, I, they're cool. I, 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 I feel like they're kind of like they're becoming a separator right now because the people who I know who are around my age who have been listening to music for a while and like weird shit, you know what I mean? Yeah. We're, we're, we're talking people who like, you know, came up in college listening to the shoe shoe albums all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, they're you tapping know, out at 100 Gex. They're tapping out on 100 Gex. They're like, what? Yeah. No. No, it's, 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 get off. it's, uh, yeah. I, I've, we've, we've just, we've just gone too far. We've just gone too far. It's, you know, it's, it's science has failed us. So we're just, but we're, we're, 100 Gex has like games done quick energy or something. Sure. You know, <laughs> kind of like which GDQ vibes. Mm -hmm. And like, that's cool. You know, I don't think, I mean, I don't, I don't think I would, I listened to that album and I, I was really impressed by it, but I only listened to it one time. It's not something that I would like put on while I'm doing dishes or, I don't know. It, it's uh, try I don't try listen. try it then. Try it though. Try, put, <laughs> put put money machine on while you're doing dishes and just see see how. Where it goes. do you where do you stand on 100 Gex? Oh, I I dig 100 Gex. I mean, it's Holy like God. you know, it's it's a short album. You know, I I think it has some flaws, but there's some real bangers on there. You know what yeah. I mean? 
um, some of my favorite tracks of, of that year on that record. And the, the remix album is insane. It's one of the craziest remix albums I think I've ever heard in my life. Like oh, there's, yeah. there's one song on there that has like three different people, including one of the dudes from fallout boy on it. And nice. like, you know, in, 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 in the fallout boy style guitars too, it's insane. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, they're, they're definitely breaking the mold, you know? I mean, um, so, okay. So also I listened to that music and I was really impressed and I thought it was really entertaining and fun to listen to. Yeah. And then I didn't like listen to it a ton or like follow them on the internet mm-hmm. that I mean, that's not where I'm at in my life, you know, that was fine. Black MIDI, similar thing where I was super impressed. Um, no, Black Midi is cool. We, 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 we like Black Midi around here. We, we like Black Midi. Yeah, we, we do appreciate Black. This is a house of, this is a house of Black Midi. Sick. Yeah. Um, super impressed with that, but obviously has no connection to the music that I would feel compelled to make or listen to for the most part. Sure. As far as... Um, but, but, but simultaneously... Super interesting and impressive. I feel like that I'll, I'll try and keep up with stuff that... that, um, that floats through as like, this is the, the wild thing that you, you know, you got to hear. And I usually am into it if it's crazy enough, you know, just in a like, yeah, that's some crazy music kind of intellectual way. Hmm. Um, how, where do you stand on like black, black MIDI, the, uh, the, 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 Schlag, the, the Schlagen, the Schlagenheim record? No, like black MIDI, the, 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 genre, genre. the genre, like the actual yeah. genre. Oh, I think it's insane. Uh, a good buddy cool. of mine, um, who did a did a bit of a YouTube show called This Exists? Did a really in depth video on the whole thing, and uh, yeah, I mean it's insane what you can do with technology. I feel like an old person saying that, but I mean it is technology um, these days. Right? Technology these days. <laughs> Speaking of something that's a lot less technological, some somebody with the name AIM username wants to know, or or is maybe this is news to you? You know, apparently you have a lot of fans in the esoteric literature community. That's what this person says. Whoa. Lots, tons of fans, huge crossover. What's esoteric literature? Well, this person wants to know. Well, apparently that their Twitter name is BLGTYLR, like BLG Tyler. It, it, it reads like, but like the, the, uh, uh, the, the vowels are taken out, BLGTYLR. Like um, Alistair Crowley, like the, well, like, um. Well, I don't know. It says esoteric literature community, Big Fleet Foxes fans, and they want to know. There- <laughs> this person wants to know uh, how how has literature inspired some of your work you know be, be, being a writer yourself obviously of, of you know in, in a way mm-hmm. so you know how, how exactly does that does that connect or does that uh, you know sort of fuel your fuel your process um you know i think that on this record literature had and not to disappoint the the, the wizards yeah don't not to disappoint um, the literature heads <laughs> to disappoint you guys but it had very little effect on my um creative process mm. on this album mm. i think i you know i i worked really hard on, on crack up and i you know i wanted those i but i ended up feeling like i was just hiding behind some 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 too many words and i just wasn't being clear enough and if i'd been a little clearer then it would have been more resonant to me you know mm. and i think on this one i just wanted to just you know let there be some like some depth in either the way the music and the, and the lyrics are interacting or in, you know, the, or in the way the vocal is delivered or they're just in a show don't tell kind of way, then, you know, thinking too much too, about it too in too literary a way, um, you know, no kind of like, I think no funny business was another kind of like um, guiding principle on this one that, now mission accomplished maybe back to some funny business next time hmm. but um i think like literature wise i don't i don't know how to connect it to music um you know i i uh, i don't want to just name some books that i like i mean i think like you know someone like whitman i don't know you know aspiring to that kind of generosity of spirit even if you're not writing in a you know a, a an antique like a 19th century way you know you can kind of um, I think that's a spirit that I that I've always tried to like, you know, wished I could inhabit that 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 kind of magnanimity or whatever. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I think it's it's almost some something worth reflecting on in in another way, kind of like linking things back to 
the the presumption of you know like the camping thing because I, I feel like you know uh, bookishness is almost presumed as well when it comes to singer songwriters or folk music and in, in all cases like obviously like lots of different people read but it it, it sort of um it, it, it ignores the history of a lot of the genre, too. I mean, you're talking about uh, a guy like Bob Dylan, for example, one of the biggest singer songwriters of all time, like his most formative and most significant days of his career getting off the ground were spent in New York, you know, just like just jobbing it at various venues that would have him. You know, he wasn't just like spending his days in a cabin or some shit. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, you know, it's 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 like this presumption of a cabin, a presumption of a beard, a presumption of a flannel, a presumption of a book. And then all of a sudden, through all of that, the song just comes out and it's just Mr. like Hot man just in his cabin. <laughs> pumpkin spice latte. <laughs> just oh. so, Dave Eggers novel. <laughs> Um, Soil Hull Chief Max uh, wants to know. Uh, hello. Dear, hello. Dear and Water Stones is one of my favorite tracks of, of yours that are unreleased. Um, did it reach full form on shore as Jara? Uh, and how was that process, if, if that presumption is is correct? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that was, I'm glad that somebody had heard that song and that they noticed that that riff showed back up in Hara. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it seems like a deep, a deep pull in terms of a fan question. Deep, it's a deeper cut and bravo. Bravo. Um, Good ear. Good ear. <laughs> and I, I don't, I don't see them as, I still see that, you know, that one song as, um, you know, uh, it was just one of those happy accidents where if you write a song simple enough that you find that you can put a part from a song 10 years older in and have it work fine. Mm. And then, you know, I think uh, that old song is still itself and it's very different from the horror song, but that line was ended up, th that guitar line ended up working in such a cool way against this new melody I, that I wrote without that line in mind mm. that it was like, just one of those things where like, yeah, this is a happy accident. Let's just, let's, let's just amplify it. Yeah. You know? Got it. All right. Well, this has been a great interview. This has been a, been a great convo. Yeah, uh, thanks, man. Thank you so much for doing it and coming through. Um, Absolutely. A lot of people in chat saying they're standing that song. Uh, and uh, yeah, just uh, you've been you've just been a joy to talk to. Hey, you too. Thank you so much, dude. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.